Welcome to Global Studies 9. Hello YouTube, this is Mr. Harris here. Um, we're looking at the Roman Empire, Section 2, Part 2 today. Um, this is, uh, it's been a while since I last recorded a video and uh, upon some feedback, uh, one of the things that kept coming back to me was that people love my singing. So I'm going to start today off with a little song. Who can say where the road goes, where the day goes, only time? Amazing. And yeah. Anyways, back to work. So, Pax Romana. So we left off where the um, first triumvirate fell apart, created the second triumvirate. The second triumvirate also fell apart, leaving Octavian as the sole ruler of Rome. And this was also the beginning of the peace and prosperity known as Pax Romana. Rome had a common coin that everyone used, which helped the vast trade network they already had, which went as far as lands like China and India. Now, as you can see, Rome during this peak covered tons of territory, including Northern Africa, Western parts of the Middle East, and what would pretty much be all of Western Europe, plus a little bit of Eastern Europe today. The well, goal wasn't only just to make Rome stronger economically, but also to beautify it. During this time period, we see the emergence of architecture like the Colosseum and the Trevi Fountain emerge. Now, when it comes to the population of Rome, we see the population skyrocket during this period, and Rome becomes as large as 70 million people, and the capital having about a million. To give you an idea of how big a million people is, the city of Athens during Rome's peak had about 100,000, so only 10%. And the city of Carthage, once one of the major trade hubs of northern Africa, at its peak too, was still at 700,000. And if you remember the Persian Empire, not too long before the Roman Empire, they peaked at 50 million. So Rome was becoming truly great in regards to size as well. And that gives you a nice little overview of their trade network. As you can see, it's not just vast in size, but vast in variety, whether it's through land or through sea. Various items can be traded, whether it's pigs, sheep, gold, tin, iron, grapes. And for northern Africa, you can even get exotic animals like lions. Now, the end of Pax Romana comes when the last great emperor, also known as Marcus Aurelius, passes away in 180 AD. Now, when it comes to emperors, the way the book describes emperors is quite interesting. They basically look at emperors as good emperors and bad emperors, and there's really a lot of emperors altogether, but I think for the sake of simplification, that's what they did. And to further simplify it, I've cut down the five good emperors to three emperors, Trajan, Hadrian, and Marcus Aurelius. Trajan is most well known for making the empire reach its peak in regards to size. Hadrian is well known for reorganizing the bureaucracy. And finally, Marcus Aurelius, also known as a renowned philosophy Philosopher, philosophizer, am I saying that right? Philosophizer um, was a, brought uh, the empire to its heights in regards to economic prosperity. And when he passes, that's also known as the end of the Roman Empire's uh, Pax Romana. Now, when it comes to the bad emperors, the book gives you three names, the mission, Nero, and Caligula. But again, for simplicity's sake, we're just going to look at Caligula and Nero. So we start off with Caligula. So many stories about this guy who became emperor at a pretty young age. His father was a great general, but um, he unfortunately was not able to follow his father's footsteps. So many stories, including him appointing a horse to the Senate, making a toilet uh, made purely out of gold. Um, he was uh, he had a little blind spot up in his head, and he was uh, he didn't want people to see the blind spot, so he wouldn't allow anyone to be a floor above him. Just the stories are endless. So that's the first guy, Caligula. So the second, quote-unquote, bad emperor is Nero. And again, he's, stories about him are endless. His murder of his mother, murder of his wife, his um, continuing persecution, very brutal persecution of Christians, uh, his killing of the men, numerous elite in Rome, and um, just odd activities he was engaged in. For example, he took out all the money Rome had to just beautify his own palace. Other things he would do was, for example, divorce and kill his wife 
and then marry a man that looked very similar to his previous wife. Another similar story to that is when he had a castrated slave uh, marry him. And uh, the stories kind of like Caligula go on and on. Perhaps one of the most infamous stories is the so-called um, Nero playing the fiddle when Rome burns. And this is actually more of a myth slash historical fact. There's not um, a lot of evidence behind this, but given Nero's history, uh, this story of him playing the fiddle while watching Rome burn uh, may not be too far away from fantasy. When it came to gods and goddesses, the society was polytheistic, so they believed in numerous gods. And uh, very similar to other polytheistic religions, their gods were very, very human-like, as in they would come down to earth, they would fight with humans, they would sometimes even make babies with humans, and the, those babies would be considered demigods, right, half human, half god. And uh, they had a lot of character, whether it be Jupiter, Neptune, Mars, Cupid. And this relates to one of the uh, Greek gods we'll look at in a second. In fact, he's actually a demigod because he's not fully a god. And before that point, just very quickly, if you look at the Roman gods, which we'll look at in a few weeks from now, very, very similar, whether it's Cupid and Eros, or Mercury and Hermes, or Hercules and Heracles, there you can tell that the two are very much uh, interconnected. So the demigod I wanted to briefly touch upon was Hercules. So he is the son of Zeus, but a but his mother is a regular human being. And um, what connects him to existing Roman emperors is Commodus. So the son of the last great emperor, the last great emperor Com uh, Marcus Aurelius, he would. Like Hercules so much, he actually renamed the month of September and October after Hercules, and he would often dress up, as you can see in that picture on the right top there, looking like Hercules. Now, Hollywood does a decent job here portraying the life of Hercules in this film, uh, named actually Hercules, where Dwayne uh, Johnson plays the role of Hercules, and he goes off on these various missions to accomplish so slavery was a significant part of Roman life. This was necessary in regards to the various laborious tasks Romans needed, especially when it came to farming. And some slaves also served as gladiators. So these were fighters that performed in the Colosseum. And this was a tough job because if you lost, it could sometimes mean that your death came along with that loss. So the reason why these coliseums were held were to, in order to control the masses. By having these big events in the coliseum, it's kind of like how people today would be watching sports on a big screen or at the stadium. It basically keeps people occupied, and that was one of the main reasons why these gladiator events took place. And um, this is a picture portraying sort of what connects into the next section. One of the events, especially when Nero was in charge included the persecution of Christians. So here you can see a group of Christians in the Colosseum and the event is the lions basically devouring them. This is before Christianity became the primary religion of Rome. Until then, as I mentioned earlier, Rome is a polytheistic society. So these gladiators were very interesting in the sense that fighting was their job. But they weren't like soldiers fighting out for territory. They were simply fighting for people's entertainment. And some stories say that some of the gladiators that were successful, if they, if they won enough fights, sometimes they were even freed. Now, there's an interesting film portraying gladiators that was released about 15 years ago starring Russell Crowe and Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, we'll check that out a bit more during class time. Um, this is the copyright disclaimer. Have a great day. Goodbye. I'm talking about the